Welcome to The Last Ottoman, a podcast series in which we discuss the Ottoman Empire and its legacy today. We are at the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking. My name is David Selim Sayers, and today, on the fourth episode of The Last Ottoman, I have the pleasure to welcome Ian Benson, former barrister and now academic and legal philosopher, who has done extensive work on religious pluralism in an international and legal framework. Among other things, Ian was one of the drafters of the South African Charter of Religious Rights and Freedoms, signed in 2010. Ian, welcome to the show. Thanks, David. It's lovely to be in Paris again and very nice to sit with you face to face here. We're very very happy to have you here, Ian. So I know, Ian, that you're not uh, an expert by any means on the Ottoman Empire or post-Ottoman situation in Turkey, etc., etc. But as somebody who's devoted a lot of... um, effort, a lot of time to the question of religious pluralism. I think uh, it's, import- it's important, it's interesting to have a conversation with you about, uh, about that starting, kind of taking our cues for a little bit from what was the case in the Ottoman Empire, what is the case in Turkey today, and maybe contextualizing that a little bit in a, in a, in a broader framework. So um, I don't know to what extent you're aware of this, Ian, but in the Ottoman Empire, uh, a variety of religious communities, different religious communities, enjoyed quite a bit of autonomy, quite a bit of legal uh, leeway, let's say. Obviously, they were all subordinated to the Sunni Muslim Ottoman state led by the Ottoman Sultan, later the Ottoman Caliph, right? Obviously, there was that, and they there were certain discriminations in place. So, for example, they had to pay extra taxes that the Sunni Muslims didn't have to pay. Uh, They couldn't appoint their own leaders of their communities. The Sultan appointed those leaders, uh, and so on and so forth. So there were certain restrictions, to be sure. There were were certain, uh, um, you know, um, problems from that perspective. But within that framework... Uh, the, uh, these different religious communities that were defined by the state and sort of separated by the state enjoyed a remarkable degree of autonomy in that they had their own courts of law in which they could settle uh, matters such as uh, family law, uh, personal law, things like uh, divorces, marriage, inheritance, things like that. They had their own educational Systems. I mean, nobody told them how to educate their children. They had their own schools, etc., etc. There was nobody was uh, interfering with their language. Say, you can't speak like this. You have to speak like that. So, and they were organized kind of around their own. I mean, in some cases, even they they even had their own law enforcement. So that you know, they had their own laws, and if somebody from that community transgressed then they had their own means of bringing that person in and taking them to court and dealing with that person rather than going through the sort of Ottoman uh, Sunni Muslim legal system. So they could bypass that. They could, they could settle things uh, among themselves. What do you think about this historical model of this sort of, can I call it a sort of legal decentralization or a legal decentralism? What do you, what do you think about that? Well, I think what you're describing is something that has a long uh, lineage in many traditions. This wouldn't be limited to the Ottomans at all. The question of how one deals generally with with the other, however the other is understood, is a a fact of really human community. So if if you think of the distinctions that might have been made under the Roman Empire between citizens and non-citizens, or that would have been made and, and are today made between what you've described as these internal um, courts uh, within r- different religions, for example, those are still recognized as having a certain scope and validity within even contemporary countries, Canada, the US, uh, South Africa, the UK, um, here even in France. There are matters that are uh, permitted to have, an in, as it were, an internal um, sort of organization and um, set of rules. Uh, so, for example, in Canada, there are church um, rules, church manuals. Uh, the internal uh, canon law of the Catholic Church would be one of these. The manual of the United Church of Canada would be another, which pres- pr- um, set out a kind of internal constitution and framework of rights and evaluation within each tradition. 
Now, this is interesting because when one joins a community such as the Catholic Church or the Jewish community or whatever, whatever sort of uh, group one is a member of, one gives tacit or express uh, permission for the rules of the, of the game, the rules of that organization to, to govern one's life. So would it mean that, for example, if I joined the Catholic Church in Canada in some way, that l different kinds of law would apply to me than if I, if I didn't? Yes, but we have to be clear here about a distinction between what we might call internal matters and external matters. And that's a line that sometimes requires litigation, determination in the, in the public, we call them the state courts, uh, where the state magistrate has to determine his or her jurisdiction over the matter in question. So uh, the law that would apply, for example, to whether I, as a Catholic, can receive communion, which is a very important thing within the Catholic Church, or within Judaism, whether or not I can marry as an Orthodox Jew, those would be termed internal matters. They have serious consequences for the community life of the Jew or the Catholic, as indeed they would have for Muslims um, under the fiqh, um, the rules of the uh, Islamic law. But how those are delineated in each and in each instance will depend upon the understanding that the secular, call them the secular magistrates, have of these internal matters within the different religious traditions. Uh, so the, uh, the example of marriage, maybe uh, to understand the whole thing a little bit better, let's say, for example, I am um, a Jewish person and uh, I want to marry somebody and uh, whether I can do so within the Jewish tradition or not is not determined by the state, but it's determined by the community. That's right. But if I, let's say, okay, so, but, but um, the state obviously also gives me the opportunity, if I cannot do that within my tradition, to bypass that and to have a secular marriage. Would that be correct? Right. So the, 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 um, I'll leave the French example out because it's a little complicated for historical reasons in terms of their unusual uh, requirement that one have the civil marriage first in France before the religious marriage thereby for the French society indicating its sense of the primacy of the state function. But that's un a bit unusual. Uh, if I may interject there, sure. uh, uh, at the risk of making you lo lose your thread of thought, I think this is actually something that um, uh, uh, Turkey uh, has. Tur uh, I mean, I don't think, I know that this is something mm -hmm. that Turkey has as well. So as one of the successor states to the Ottoman Empire, uh, Turkey today insists on, uh, well, at least on paper, insists on a on a on a secular uh, state approved marriage and will not allow the sole uh, marriage under islamic religious law will not give legal validity to that so uh, you may go and marry sort of uh, get be married by an imam as well obviously if you want to do that but that is more of a sort of ceremonial thing if you want your marriage if you want your marriage to have legal validity then you need to go and do that through the state and i think this is one of the reasons for that is the states the modern turkish states very strong reaction to this perception that it was ultimately I mean, this kind of religious confessional pluralism or, let's say, frag fragmented nature of the Ottoman Empire that ultimately led to the sort of disintegration of that empire. I mean, the sort of the, this kind of li religious pluralism is often seen as a main culprit in the fact that this empire fell apart. And therefore, the Turkish state has always had this very strong emphasis on dictating, so sort of being the final arbiter of what is official, what is legal, etc., etc., and not leaving any of that up to any kinds of religious community. Right. Now, this kind of thing that you're describing is um, uh, really an artifact of human communities all around the world and in different periods of history we can see it changing and developing moving from a, a, what we might call a con uh, more strict constrained controlled framework to perhaps a more um, expansive and loose framework in which the uh, laws themselves would allow a certain looseness in the linkage for how one is married in relation to the state or not and you can see this right up into the current day uh, South Africa, for example, has had to wrestle with the fact that certain forms of marriage uh, were not recognized within the South African context, leaving Muslim women in particular 
who were the third, second, third, or fourth wife allowed within Islam, but not recognized within South African law, leaving them somewhat in limbo. And there was debate with a lot of uh, Muslim women, for example, and a lot of women's groups took it on as one of their tasks to try and protect um, these women, uh, give them a fairer kind of, uh, or more just, as they argued, uh, uh, position within South African society. And indeed, the Constitutional Court recently in South Africa agreed with them. And what it did was it brought within the fold of of contemporary marital understandings the multiple marriage concept, which traditionally would not have fit within the um, Judeo-Christian framework with, of South African society. Now, that society had had for a long time the presence of Muslims within it, going back to the, uh, you know, the Cape Malays, for example, who were brought over originally as slaves in the Cape area, and now there's an extensive Muslim population there. So what you're seeing here is how does contemporary law deal with these what we might call traditional or customary of religiously based conceptions, which ne- might not fit it. Mm-hmm. Now, this internal question, which we were discussing a moment ago, um, raises its head when there's a specific religious um, requirement that uh, is not met for reasons of a debate within the religion, where the question is, can the external, the, the state magistrate offer relief to the religious person who feels aggrieved. And you're, you mentioned marriage and, and uh, Jude, I think Judaism briefly there, but there's two cases in two regimes I can think of that deal precisely with the Jewish marriage, Jewish marriage question in relation to divorce. Because under Orthodox Judaism, a woman is not permitted to remarry unless she receives from her husband, her ex-husband, something known as a get. Now, whether one uh, receives a get or not is up to the husband, but you can imagine, as these cases indeed um, develop, a problem that uh, occurs when the husband, for whatever reason, refuses to give this get. Um, Now, the leading case here in the Canadian Supreme Court is a case called Brooker and Markovitz, in which, in the course of a marital divorce discussion and settlement, the man promised that he would give his wife the get, and then when the divorce occurred, he refused to give it. So the question here was, can this woman now go to the state, the secular courts, and say, this person uh, ought to have given me the get, which is in fact what she did. Now, the argument, and you can imagine what it was, was, well, from, from on behalf of his counsel was, well, that's a religious matter. It's not justiciable by the secular courts in Canada. And that was what he or his counsel argued. The Supreme Court of Canada took an interesting approach here. They ruled that because the negotiation in, a, in the context of a divorce constitutes a contract, a promise made by him to do such and such in the course of the divorce, a contract is a matter that's properly justiciable by the court. The nature of the get what it meant within Judaism and so forth, was not a matter for the court's adjudication, but that this had been promised in a contractual way was. Now, what this shows us is an interesting demarcation there, a kind of facilitation of a legal remedy through, uh, quote, secular law, unquote, which I think both protects the internal dimension of the religion, doesn't deal with its dogmatic understanding of the get, whether or not that's just or appropriate, but does say that because it satisfied a legal, properly secular legal um, dispute uh, context, namely contract law, it was uh, justiciable, fully justiciable by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ordered that the get should have been given because it had been promised. Mm -hmm. So there you see an interesting way of, of, uh, as it were, squaring the circle to allow both the protection of the internal religious dimension and the protection of the person in relation to secular law. And this is the case with many uh, questions. For example, the selection of religious leaders uh, within Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, um, the rules related to the conduct of ceremonies, etc., etc. These things may have what we could call doctrinal or dogmatic importance, 
But those doctrinal and dogmatic aspects are not properly justiciable in the secular courts in most countries. Now, of course, there are countries which have a more theological conception of the public discourse. And there the question is, um, if the country uh, defines itself as, the, as happened in Calvin's Geneva in the day, or happened in, uh, you know, when the Treaty of Westphalia, which was so important in the 16th century, um, or the treaties that led to the Westphalian peace in the 16th century, if they have a conception there that our state can choose between Catholicism, Lutheranism, or Calvinism, which was the case then in the 16th century, under a principle of called cuis regio, eus regio, which means that the leader or the prince has the right to choose the religion of, of his own state. The Treaty of Westphalia, from, from which we derive the idea of national sovereignty, um, it said it's up to the prince or the sovereign to determine the religion of the country. Of course, that then leaves open uh, for adjudication or law what the treatment is going to be of the minorities. So you've raised the question of the Ottomans, and, the, and we'll, see here, we'll see in everywhere where this question of what we might call religious pluralism or even legal pluralism is, is, is raised, what is the scope of freedom for those who are not part of the majority right. faith? Right. I mean, you've raised so many interesting issues here, Ian. I'm, uh, I'm just right now uh, thinking about struggling with which one I want to take up first. But let's just start with the let's just start with the last one that you mentioned. And let me just let me let me just uh, uh, say a few things that come to mind regarding that this cuius regio eius religio, the prince in the Treaty of Westphalia chooses the religion of a not just the state, not just the official state religion, but the religion to which the people within that sort of, well, I don't want to call it a nation because we're not there yet, but the people encompassed by that territory have to follow. Is that correct? That's right, although um, as the nations develop, they adapt that in different ways. So, for example, in Switzerland, the cantons themselves or organize themselves around a particular religion. Some are Catholic, some Protestant. Uh, so this would this would be, for example, just to just to bring it back to the Ottoman example, hmm. uh, in the Ottoman Empire, the idea that a state religion would also be at the same time a religion that everybody within the state would have to follow, like every all, all of the subjects of that of that of that ruler would have to follow would be would have been regarded as absurd. Right. I mean, the state religion existed. It was a certain form of Sunni Islam. But within that framework, there was a lot of leeway, uh, as I was describing, like the, all of these different religious communities could continue to exist the way that they were before. And uh, um, one of the main reasons for that, I mean, uh, thinking about it just in terms of um, uh, what these states were really like and what they were trying to achieve and what they were trying to do, we're talking about the context of an agrarian empire of course. Mm -hmm. And the main idea, the main idea with an agrarian empire is basically, okay, I am occupying or conquering agricultural land. My goal here is the extraction of some kind of agricultural surplus. The only way that I'm going to grow my economy is by growing the, the amount of land that I have, because there is a technical limitations. We're not within industrialization, right? There are, uh, there are um, uh, technical limitations to, 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 to how much productivity I can get out of a certain piece of land. So I need more and more land in order to grow my economy more and more, right? But... Uh, um, my main idea about what to do with this land that I conquer is to keep the people in peace, let them continue doing their agriculture as, as far as I can, as long as they're paying their taxes, as long as, as long as they're not rebelling against me. I don't really have any interest in standardizing that population in any way, right? Rather... It is actually, like in, in many cases within the Ottoman Empire, the expansion of the Ottoman Empire, what happened was that even the rulers, the local rulers who were in place when the Ottomans arrived, if they handed over peacefully, if they sort of integrated themselves into this political endeavor peacefully, then even the rulers weren't changed. And they stayed in place, and the, the customs and the practices and the religions and everything stayed in place because there was neither any kind of 
obvious interest for the Ottomans in standardizing all this population, nor was it possible. I mean, you know, technically possible. They didn't have the manpower. They didn't have the, you know, they didn't have any of the resources that the modern state has to sort of really penetrate into these populations and try to try to standardize them mm-hmm. in a way that the modern state can. This was absolutely, this was something beyond mm-hmm. any dream that any agrarian emperor could have. Right. Well, this tension between the, the faith of the ruler and the faiths, faiths, plural, of the population is a human fact. It's happened all through history. And the question really is, in terms of the internal or, ordering of the state, is it going to be one that sets itself, as, sets itself up as having pluralism within the state for different belief systems, some of them, well, most of them historically understood religiously, um, or not. So if you look at the history of the West, you have um, separation of church and state. You have the establishment. You may have an established church. Um, for example, in England, after the 16th century, Henry VIII takes over the, the Catholic Church and starts the Church of England. Um, you, it's one thing to have an established church. It's quite another to have a functioning theocracy where you effectively have a rule of the state by the religion. And then as you move forward in history, certainly in the West, you start to see the rise of either a separation doctrine along the American model, where you have this strict separation of church and state as a contemporary understanding of that, or you might have a model like contemporary England, South Africa, or Australia, which is best understood as the cooperation of church and state, where in those regimes you may have the state funding religious education, funding religious hospitals, and so forth. In other words, allowing different ethics related to the religious faith to coexist. Now, in Canada, which has a cooperation model, it also has a a French um, uh, province, Quebec, which has a very different kind of take on religion. I always used to think it was interesting that as a constitutional lawyer, most of the leading religious cases in Canadian law come out of Quebec because there you have a really contested conception of what religion um, is to the culture. And you had uh, famously the, the Révolution Tranquille, the quiet revolution so-called in Quebec, in which the very strong, powerful, strident Catholicism of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s starts to be under increasing criticism and attack within Quebec society, and you have a move towards a kind of um, secularism, as it were, to use that 19th century term of Holyoke, uh, secularism to effectively diminish the public importance of Catholicism within Quebec. So there, and now you have a lot of religious debates within Quebec that, as I said, spark the litigation in Canada. So you know, on the major debates dealing with church and state relationships, a case called Maltani involved a Sikh student and whether he could wear his kirpan in a public school setting. When the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that he could, there was a firestorm within Quebec society because they wanted a more strict, what in France or in Quebec would be called laicisme, yeah. a strict separation. Yeah. Of religion. The, 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 the laicisme uh, uh, concept and, uh, and uh, uh, idea brings me straight back to the Turkish case because the Turkish case ostensibly when the Republic of Turkey was founded in 1923 and replaced at least on part of its territory replaced the Ottoman Empire the idea was well the Ottoman Empire during its last you know roughly two decades or so, a bit less than two decades, had already been dominated by a sort of very Western-oriented, Western-educated, I want to say a lot of them were atheists, young uh, Western-educated elite, which had basically taken over, de facto taken over the sort of rulership of the country from the Sultan uh, already in 1908, and they were running uh, they were uh, 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 called uh, basically uh, uh, organized around this uh, around this uh, uh, society called the uh, uh, Union and Progress, the Committee for Union and Progress. And as you can see in the in the in the in the name, we already have a, a sort of a very nationalistic or proto nationalistic element coming in with union and a very sort of science oriented. Uh, uh, 
idea, uh, a sort of modernity-oriented idea of progress. Right. And, the, and then when uh, the modern Tur uh, sort of Republic of Turkey grew out of this, in a sense, um, you had this, well, incorporated into, uh, into the laws of the, of the new state, this idea of laicism. But in the Turkish case, it was very interesting. It was not a separation of church and state. Well, church uh, would be wrong to say church, but it was much more of a subjugation of uh, church to state. So the state actually, in that sense, actually you could say there was a continuity with the Ottoman case because what you see with the Ottomans is always a primacy of the political over the religious. So for example, if we go back all the way to, uh, to Mehmet the Conqueror, who was the Ottoman Sultan who conquered Constantinople. Mm -hmm. um, Mehmet the Conqueror, after the conquest of Constantinople, instituted the famous, infamous fratricide law, whereby each Ottoman Sultan who ascends to the Ottoman throne is obligated by this law to uh, uh, to execute to eliminate all of his brothers in order to in order to uh, kind of um, you know uh, make it impossible for any sort of succession trouble any kind of uh, you know secession etc etc that kind of thing to happen down the line and he said and there's a quote from uh, uh, the documents are preserved and he says this is for the continuity of the state plus most religious doctors, most doctors of religion, meaning most ulama, agree that this is a that this is a defensible, doable thing. Well, now of course it isn't. It ab obviously, absolutely isn't. But in the Ottoman case, over and over again over the centuries, we see this fact that the ruler, you know, makes a decision, and then his religious uh, cadre, the job of that religious cadre is to sort of make that decision palatable. Somehow find something in the tradition that will that will justify that will justify the direction that the that the that the sultan wants to take. So in that sense the sultan says or decides or does something and then the religious cadre the job of the religious cadre is to justify it. So interesting. Yeah, so religion in the service ultimately of of a, of a of a very real politic oriented or sort of a very kind of uh, of a ruler who has other priorities, let's put it that way. Right? Now, uh, when we come to, to come to the Turkish case, um the way that they interpreted laicism was not that, you know, okay, the state will not be involved with religion, religious organizations can sort of form on their own within the public sphere, etc., etc., they can do their own thing. No, uh, the religious brotherhoods, the religious organizations of the Ottoman Empire were shut down by the state, and the state instituted uh, or created a directorate of religious affairs through which they exercised official control of the majority religion of Sunni Islam, right? And the way they did that was, for example, mosques came under state control, were funded by the state, the imams who sat in the mosques were no longer people who were appointed by communities or by religious or local communities, they were appointed by the state, they, they are civil servants paid by the state, the fatwa that they read out on, on, on Fridays is handed to them by the state and the goal uh, and this is very interesting because at the beginning of the Turkish Republic the goal was uh, arguably to weaken religion because these were very sort of you know a lot of them as I said a lot of these sort of uh, this ruling elite was uh, atheistic or they thought that religion was a kind of backwards influence so is this 13th 14th century no, now we're talking about the foundation of the Republic of Turkey so later right so we're talking about the 20th century uh, uh, 1923 around that time right so so here the goal now was I, I made the parallel to to Mehmet the Conqueror to show the continuity mm -hmm. in the way that a, sort of the, the quote-unquote secular or sort of the, like the political was supreme to the to the religious the religious was in the service of the political mm -hmm. right? now in the Turkish case it became interesting because at first um, this system was used in order to weaken ostensibly the, the impact, the influence of religion on the population, right? The goal was to sort of quote-unquote enlighten the population. Uh, they also changed the alphabet, as you know, from Arabic to the Latin alphabet. So, so sort of to, 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 to lessen the, the hold of, 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 of religion, religious organizations, etc., etc., on the people. Now, over the decades, of course, as Turkish politics became more and more religious, the same tool was used 
by new uh, sort of more religious political parties who came to power in Turkey in order to strengthen certain kinds of religion, in order to promote certain kinds of religion. So, But in either case, whether it is to weaken religion or to strengthen certain kinds of religion, it's always under the tutelage of the state. Yeah. Well, this is Kuis Regio um, with a twist, really. Uh, but it's, it's, one has to understand, uh, you're putting this very, very helpfully for me, because the parallels to other traditions are quite extraordinary. Um, uh, one thinks, for example, of the shift in English culture between the 16th century, when Henry VIII takes over and starts the, the Church of England, and the, the, what we could call civil penalties that attach to not being a member of the Church of England. I mean, initially it's graphic in the sense that you have uh, Catholicism is simply outlawed under one of the sovereigns. And there, if to be caught as a priest in England is to be killed, you're simply going to be ex- exterminated, erased. Uh, so Gerard writes his famous diary, book, Diary of a Hunted Priest. And, and the, to this day, if you go to the area where the, so the recusants were in Yorkshire and so forth, you'll find these country homes with priest holes where they would hide the religious figures because they would be a, in fear of their life just for being there. Of course, this is some ameliorated over time by civil laws, back and forth debates, the Bill of Rights and so forth, and then it gradually rules to weaken the restraints on Catholics to the point where in the 19th century you can finally attend Oxford or Cambridge as a non-Anglican and graduate. You weren't allowed, those penalties all the way 16th, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, into the 19th century, you have to be a member of the Church of England to graduate from Oxford or Cambridge. Shelley is famously sent down for, oh, mind you, he rubbed the uh, university officials at Oxford's noses in it, but Shelley was sent down for being an atheist, right? Um, so you need to be religious, and you need to be religious of a particular sort. And this is, in a sense, a kind of Erastianism, as it was known. It's where the state uses religion as an organizing or, or uh, controlling framework. Now, we move away from that in two directions. Separation, where religion is deemed to be no longer relevant. Um, It can exist outside the state, but it has no state power. Or we move to cooperation, which I mentioned earlier, which is the functional cooperation with religion. Or we can move to a more strident form of the sort you're describing, which is a kind of theocracy, which is the rule of Um, the state by religion. So you can have religion under the state, Erastianism, you can have it outside the state, separation, or you can have it like the rings on the Olympic symbol um, within the state cooperation. Now these all contemporary frames of politics and constitutionalism have in, in a sense partaken of bits and pieces of these different frameworks. I think we can agree about that. And I would suspect that as you're, as an Ottoman expert thinking about this, you're seeing how these parallels would apply within the history and development of the um, Islam within, within Turkey. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely really interesting for me to see. I mean, you know, I have to say my, my main interest in history, when I study history, uh, Ottoman history uh, in particular, but also other kinds of history, is not as... Um, something that is somehow obsolete, outdated, or in the teleological sense has led us to today as a sort of preparation for today, right? Mm-hmm. Some kind of, you know, uh, older version. But, but, uh, but, but, but I like to think about history as something that if I, if I can kind of immerse in it in the right way, or, or if I can at least attempt to sort of uh, attempt this I- impossible task of putting myself in the shoes of people who lived in different uh, periods of history, they, from that perspective, then I can get a kind of new and different and unexpected perspective on the present. And it's very fascinating for me to see you talk about all the different ways in which um, um, something that you might look at this Ottoman Empire, you might say, okay, this is completely historical, this is done and over with, actually continues to live on in different, or not live on, but has parallels has, uh, in, in, in different uh, illegal systems in different ways around the world. I just want to, uh, 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 if I may, 
I just want to take you back to this uh, to this example of the to this example of the of the of the multiple wives that you mentioned under South African law, and uh, that's a very very interesting uh, interesting topic. So, for example, um, let's see uh, in. Uh, the Ottoman case, obviously, I mean, the, the, the Ure, it was possible to have multiple wives. De facto, for example, in Ottoman Constantinople, we know that, that this wasn't something that happened so often. But um, uh, the, the law, for example, that would allow me to have multiple wives would obviously only apply to me if I were a Muslim, obviously. And uh, the example that you gave in Canada with the get, for example, right? If, if, uh, if it, within a Jewish community inside the Ottoman Empire, the husband refused to to grant that kind of thing it would not be possible again for for the wife to go out and i don't know find recourse at a sort of muslim court of law or something like that in order to escape that in order to sort of circumvent or find, find a way as you put it earlier to square the circle mm. and to sort of maybe remain within her tradition but be absolved of that of that of that obligation right and the ottomans would have been very hesitant for example to say they were very uh concerned with um also uh, the 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 integrity and the the the, the sort of the, the the of these different uh, religious communities. So I think the Ottomans would have also been hesitant to say to a, a Jewish woman, "Well, you know, if she wants to come over and seek recourse at a at a at a at some kind of other kind of court of law, theoretically." Uh, there would have been pushback against that. No, you belong to this community and you're subject to the laws of that community. Mm -hmm. So, so, and you stay there, you stay where you are. And it is not our job to defend you against your community, right? Or to, to, to find some recourse for you that you can't find within your own community, yeah. right? And now that is very interesting because here, I think with the modern state, we have a, a sort of, penetration of the boundaries of these communities, a little bit of a sort of a more of a porosity in, in introduced also legally into the into the boundaries of these communities so that the 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 uh, the, the line gets a little bit blurry between the community, the religious community that the person belongs to and if I may put it that way, the society, right? The society that the modern state is trying to create. Mm -hmm. And there is a kind of tension between this community and this society, I feel, because the modern state, for a variety of reasons, is in the business of dissolving those communities, individua individuating the particular components of those communities, making them into individuals in the sense that they sort of become direct addressed by the state one-on-one -on -one, right and thereby integrated into this sort of broader project of society that the modern state is trying to create right so it creates a tension uh, both on the political level between the sort of society and the the, the the society the nation that the state is trying to create and the religious community on the one hand but also on the individual level a tension of loyalty between uh, between the sort of between the religious community and the the broader society that is enabling you in the modern sense to be an individual yeah what do you think about that oh well oh uh, you're, you're the way you're framing this is so helpful and for me extremely fertile let me tie together a few thoughts that come to mind first of all this tension between the person the individual the community the society, the state, each one of these terms we could unpack. What is, contemporary liberalism tends to focus on the idea of the individual rather than the person. And individualism within liberal thought is considered one of its problems in, if you're going to problematize contemporary liberalism. Because within the religious traditions, certainly within Christianity, a person is necessarily relational. Within, within contemporary liberalism, an individual may, is, may not be so. And indeed, the term that goes with individualism deeply into contemporary liberal uh, articulation is uh, autonomous individual. Well, auto that's two Greek words meaning self-law. But you see, for the religions, the law is not uh, discovered or promulgated individually. It's framed within the sort of prior conditions emerging from the cosmos, from nature. So all of the great religious traditions have a co richly f framed cosmology. 
and the five things within the Western natural law tradition, which of course isn't just Western because natural law is, is universal. And, and we have a tension, a big tension in contemporary um, human cultures between the idea of the universal. So we, in, when we need it most in 1948, what do we promulgate? The universal declaration of human rights, which begins with this idea of inherent dignity of the person. Mm. Well, this is not a creation of law. That's the first thing we have to say. It's a recognition by law of a pre-existing state of affairs. And if one looks at not only the United Nations uh, documents, but at everything since, the terms that appear in all the preambular formulations of the Universal Declaration, and, and anyone can do this themselves by simply looking it up. You'll see what I'm saying is absolutely accurate. Every one of those formulations begins with terms such as whereas or recognizing. In other words, the document is not seen as creating the rights it articulates, but rather as simply formulating rights and conceptions of obligation, which are rooted in what? In the nature of the human person and community. Now, this takes us into a set of metaphysical affirmations that are rather difficult to find in contemporary liberal thought, which have come out of secularism, Hollyoaks term in 1851, which sees itself as setting the state apart from religions. But note this, if we go back to the Greek formulation of the tension, for example, as narratively described in Sophocles' Antigone, we see there the gods have set it in train a, a tradition. Um, Antigone herself says, we don't know from where these propositions come, but these are the rules of the gods. And King Creon says, this, I'm giving you a positive edict against what? Against sacred burial of, of Antigone's brother, hence the tension in the play. So that's 2,500 years BC, you know, before the common era, whatever you want to call it. Um, 2,500 years from now, certainly ago, 5th century BC, we have this, in dramatic form, tension between the rules of the gods and the rule of the king there. Henry V, part one, as you were talking earlier, um, in Shakespeare's Henry V, um, and you were talking about the Ottoman freedom of religion or understanding of religion being used, taken over to legitimize what the state wanted to do. Well, that's Henry V. And the op that opening scene of Henry V, Shakespeare delineates how Henry is listening to his advisors saying, does he have a historical right to claim the crown of France? And they go through all of the laws. You remember the scene, or it's powerfully described in the play, and in Branagh's brilliant film on, uh, of Henry V. So there again, the king can act, but he has to act with a certain religious uh, warrant. There has to be a historical or religious warrant for his actions. And then, thirdly, let's go forward yet further from Henry V and Pat Long after Sophocles. Let's look at Giorgio Agamben's sermon in this very city, um, at Notre Dame when he speaks in his book The Church and the Kingdom about his view of two things. One, the role that Christianity should have in describing the human position in time as that of an exile with a message to time to create a narrative of explanation about the limits of power and time and how in his view that's been, that ball has been dropped by Christianity against what? He calls it the hypertrophy of law. So for Agamben, what we've seen is a, is a hypertrophic, a growth beyond its proper scope of law, right? So what's happening here? This ancient tension, we can call it a perennial tension between the gods and time, articulated through either expl explicitly through religious narratives or implicitly through power, as contemporary cultures have to wrestle with the limits of the state and how the state squares itself with morality or metaphysics. And what you start to see is that what's described by many scholars as the crisis of contemporary liberalism is that it doesn't any longer have a rich enough framework metaphysically to really articulate morality, which is why 
to, to leap in. No, this is, may seem to some of your listeners like a complete leap off a precipice, in which case I apologize, but I think it's still, still a useful leap to consider. Why has the language of values come to dominate our moral discourse? when there was a long tradition, globally, in all religions and ethical codes, of virtues. Right. Now, virtues and values are not the same thing. In the, art, in the world of values, you have your values, I have mine, is the first often implicit presupposition. And the second implicit one is, don't push your values on me. So the first, you have yours and I have mine, individualizes whatever these values are. And the second one, don't push yours on me, suggests that ours are equally valid, therefore there's no superiority possible between these different articulations. Well, of course, Nietzsche was right about this. So when Nietzsche talk, calls for a transvaluation of values, in that uh, you get it in the posthumous uh, uh, Will to Power book, um, the role of values, this, this self, this kind of... Um, Kenosis. I'm pushing myself into the world. I'm framing this world around me. I'm not discovering our, this world in terms of a reality beyond myself. I do it as an individual. It's my will against your will. And, and Nietzsche gets this. Nietzsche articulates it brilliantly. So this is, this is uh, I'm, I'm going to jump in here. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to see if, I, um, if, 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 I'm, if I'm getting this right. Mm -hmm. so now... At the point where we are talking about values, mm -hmm. what you're saying is it becomes a it, it becomes an individual question rather than a sort of a virtue being framed in a let's say more in a universal way. Yes, or or let's drop it from universal to even a social way. Okay. Social way. Now now this is interesting because uh, in a way you could say that the "don't push yours on me" principle is in effect. Uh, uh, in a way, in in a in a in a, in a in a in a context like the Ottoman Empire, where the different religions are recognized within their own frameworks, and uh, they 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 get to decide sort of the fates of their own communities within their own frameworks without having to fear interference from the other religious traditions, from the other religious communities. So there is a sort of a, I mean, yes, there is a kind of um, implicit that there is a superior. Uh, ruling religious understanding, the religious understanding of the Ottoman state, that that is somehow kind of uh, the tutelage of that is, is sort of over the other ones. But still, within that framework, you have these different, you have these different alternative coexisting, okay. ways, which they maybe don't even want to really. They don't want those to link up necessarily. Well, you know, it's uh, it's useful for them within the sort of context of this multilingual, multi-ethnic empire. Until, of course, we come to the 19th century, sort of disintegration, nationalistic trends, etc. Outside interference, sort of uh, 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 great powers like Russia and France claiming protectorship of uh, certain religious groups within the Ottoman Empire and using them as wedges to drive into the empire. So until you come to that point, until you come to that point of sort of weakness understood in that sense this system is actually works well for the ottoman overlords to say okay you you have your set you you have your set and you know we're not going to encourage you to mingle in fact maybe we're gonna you know we're, we're quite happy with you being separate and sort of sort of staying where you are yeah I, i'd want to make a distinction here that i think is absolutely fundamental and critically important and that is to keep clear the difference in our conversation between what we might call state structure yeah. and what we might call content of religious difference. Because I think people have made far too much of the latter as a kind of a metaphysical and moral relativism, when in fact there is no such thing. And here my, my, I'm taking my thought here from a long line of natural law theorists but particularly a powerful little book, which um, has been far too little noticed, I think, from 1943, called The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis, which details the, the idea of a moral tradition and how, when you understand a moral tradition from within itself, you start to realize, once you articulate its con central conceptions, how much those are similar to different. I understand. Traditions. So, so basically, what you're saying is sort of the formal distinction 
uh, imposed by the state mm-hmm. between, let's say, sort of the Orthodox Christian group and the Catholic Armenian group or the Jewish. Uh, and that is more of a politically sort of opportune distinction for the state to make in terms of its sort of, let's maybe call it a divide and rule policy or something like that, that pertains more to that. And also, of course, more to the sort of internal hierarchies of these religious groups, which also within which uh, a sort of a, a, a specific organization made of a, made up of specific people benefits from the separation and benefits from the possibility of controlling that internal hierarchy. That, that is more of a political distinction you're saying than necessarily you'll find in the sort of the tenets, the philosophy, the, the view of life uh, uh, espoused within each of these different uh, within each of these different groups. Yeah. That's actually a very, very interesting point because um, the political separation, you can see that in Turkey today as well. So for instance, you have groups in Turkey, different religious groups in Turkey today most of them Muslim because most of the non-Muslim groups have been sort of either exterminated or banished or, 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 or driven out of the country. So the non-Muslim population of Turkey today is negligible. But within the Muslim population of Turkey, there are, there are uh, um, very pronounced differences. So, for example, you have a very uh, a large group uh, between 10 and 15 million people uh, of Alevi faith, which is a faith that is close, more closely is sort of has closer ties to Shia Islam or even to sort of Central Asian sort of shamanistic beliefs than it does to Sunni Islam. And uh, within certain Sunni Muslim groups, there is this thing that even going to the home of an Alevi or, you know, sharing a plate, let's say, with an Alevi. If you invite an Alevi to your home and you share a plate with that person, you give that person something to eat on that plate, later you might want to throw that plate away. You know, so so there is this very... And, and, and of course, like, you know, uh, uh, um, the anecdotes uh, that I have about this are always result in, like, you know, once you get to know each other on the personal level, you discover that you're actually not that different, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which brings you back to the point that the distinctions, this, this sort of othering process, if you will, a sort of extreme form of identity politics is, a, is, is, is more of a political tool than, 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 than actually based on the diff- differing content, the sort of the life teachings of these, uh, of these, uh, of these traditions. Well, of course. This is an f- absolutely fundamentally important theme in terms of um, what we might call, uh, certainly in my tradition as a Catholic, the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. Love is the form of all the virtues. Now, what, who, who ought I to love? The answer is everyone. Who, who, the model of this, of course, is the teachings of Christ, which obviously is not the subject of our our discourse today, but they're nonetheless relevant for this reason. The question of what is clean or unclean, the question of who's, who is my neighbor, the question is who are my brothers and sisters, is absolutely foundational for, for human communities. Now, we might fast forward and say, well, how is this dealt with within contemporary liberal theory? How is this dealt with within contemporary education? And the answer is universally not well. Why? Well, amongst other things, they're trying to do this with the language of values, which is not the language of the Aristotelian West with its four cardinal virtues of justice, wisdom, moderation, and courage. These things that are cardinal, from cardes meaning hinge, the justice, wisdom, moderation, and courage are not a property of my will at all. They're, I need to be educated through the humanities to learn what virtues are, why they're obligatory on me and how human flourishing, eudaimonia, is rooted in my instantiating these habits in my life and in the life of my community. Now, can we say, pulling the lens back on our conversation thus far, that these um, abilities to articulate and pass on virtues within different traditions are important for the world of human communities or not? Are we going to see ourselves drawn further and further to this subjectivized, amorphous, ambiguous world of values Mm -hmm. in which a value is driven by the marketplace? Or are we going to see that marketplace domination contested by traditions of virtues? We can call them that, I think. Yeah. 
That's a very, very important question. I mean, the, the, the adjectives that you were just using, the subjectivized and the amorphous, it brings me back to what you were saying a few minutes earlier about the, the, the sort of individual, the, the individual who is now considered in these traditions that you're talking about, these modern traditions, mm. the autonomous individual. Yeah. And uh, uh, when I teach my course on nationalism, on the history of nationalism, right. Uh, I like to. I often like to read uh, uh, um, some passages from Ernest Gellner's book on nations and nationalism, who has some, uh, for me, very uh, brings a very interesting um, um, economic or sort of yeah. let's say uh, perspective to the whole thing, yeah. right? And and uh, uh, the argument is basically, and I'm not telling you anything new, I'm sure, but the argument is that well, basically, within uh, 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 an agrarian economy, com coming back to this idea of the agrarian state versus the industrial state, mm -hmm. in an agrarian economy, an agrarian culture, an agrarian state, uh, the dominating sort of discourse is a discourse of sort of cosmological order, stasis, if you will, a recurrence, some kind of, you know, cyclical recurrence, a seasonal recurrence of, of human affairs. Mm -hmm. Uh, as uh, as uh, Hemingway puts it in the beginning of the sun also rises with a quote from Ecclesiastes, right? The the sun will rise again, the rivers will return to from whence they came, etc., etc. So this this idea that ultimately, um, you know, generation after generation, we are we are going through the same process, which brings us to this basically. Uh, I suppose it connects fruitfully to to what you were saying about the virtues, the sort of the way that these uh, principles arise from nature. They're there for us to be discovered, etc. Etc. Et and then, of course, within this system, right, the idea that uh, humans, individuals, coming to this idea of individuals, yeah. Yeah. are embedded uh, inextricably, if you will, almost inextricably embedded, at least this on the discursive level, yes. I mean, also Gellner says, like, in reality, you know, uh, of course, things are different than in the discourse. But, you know, the, the, the principle, the basic principle is that the individual, not the individual, but the person, the body, the in you know, uh, is part of something larger, is part of a household, is part of some kind of community. Yeah. And this community can be understood in a sort of economic way, as a sort of self-sustaining micro-economic unit, right? If we tie it back to this idea of the agrarian empire, for example, the Ottoman Empire, the idea of the expansion of the Ottoman Empire is why do all agrarian empires expand? Because the only way to grow their economy is to grow their land, is to grow the amount of land that they have, because they can't increase productivity on the land that they have, so they need more land, right? But within that land that is conquered, the economy does not become, the agrarian economy does not become integrated in any sense that we would understand sort of in the modern sense, an integrated economy. It's an aggregation, an agglomeration of self-sustaining microeconomies that continue and sustain their ways of life on the level of the household, the village, the community, something like that, right? So my argument would be that in a sort of non-industrial, in an agrarian context, when we talk about the individual, the thing that can't be divided, we can't talk about you or me. We need to talk about the household. The household is the individual or is it sort of the community that the self-sustaining microeconomic community is the individual. Now, and then, uh, if I may, uh, when we come to industrialization, of course, the whole thing changes, right? With industrialization, what we're aiming for now is an integrated, integrated uh, modern sort of uh, let's drop that word an integrated economic uh, industrial workforce right yes. so what we're going to do is now if, uh, as the state what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to tick we're going to want to atomize these former individuals these households these communities right we're going to want to dissolve them one of my students called it nuking them and i thought it was so appropriate because we're d dividing it into its nuclei Right, and we're going to want to take those nuclei out of those communities, put them through some kind of blender, let's call it the modern education system, the national education yeah. system, yeah. and turn those individuals into what we term a society, right, in which mm -hmm. they become, as you were saying, subjectivized, mm -hmm. amorphous, mm -hmm. replaceable, anonymous, standardized, so that we can use them inside of the modern world. Yeah. Well, you're describing superbly um, so many themes here that interrelate. I'm thinking of the term holism, which is coined by Jan Smuts, mm 
in his book, Holism and Creative Evolution. In the early 20th century, he writes that book. And in it, he juxtaposes what he calls the organic with the mechanistic. Now, Smuts was this really extraordinary polymath. I mean, he, he's well known in statesmanship, obviously, as a first president of South Africa. And then he becomes part of, his, his genius is recognized at the Treaty of Versailles, where he argues against the final document on the grounds that it will simply create a disaster down the road. He's completely right. But he gets made a fellow of the Royal Society in the United Kingdom. You have to remember, this is the second son of a rural farming family in the Cape of South Africa. He goes on not only to become part of Churchill's war cabinet in the Second War, but he ends up being made chancellor of the University of Cambridge. I mean, this is inconceivable. That's a, typically a royal office. But Smuts, whom Churchill called the, the greatest mind of his generation, comes up with this idea of holism and integration. Why? Because he studies nature. He becomes an expert, in, and he's, he's across so many different fields, it's quite spectacular to consider. Um, but... He wrote a, a work, and he was deeply learned about South African grasses. So he literally starts with the agriculture, the cult from which we get our conception of cult, the idea that, of earth, that what comes naturally from the ground up for smuts has something to say to us about the ordering of human communities. And you use the term integration and disintegration. Now, I'm not sure we're using it precisely the same way, but the idea for me of disintegration ties in with the idea of um, a loss of integrity. But what kind of integrity? Because for Kojev, you have a universal and hom homogenous state. That's not what Smuts is talking about. It's not what you're really talking about in terms of this idea of the, what we might call properly the celebration of diversity. What Smuts is saying it, with the idea of holism is that in holistic is to recognize the distinctive nature of parts and their necessary integration in the cosmology and framework of being. This is deeply an Aristotelian move from a reflection on being itself and flourishing itself to the, uh, in a sense, disintegration of the contemporary project with this idea of mechanization takes command, as Gideon called it. Right, a book which was of great influence on Marshall McLuhan. So, so my dear friend uh, uh, told me in Canada, who wrote the biography of of McLuhan, um, uh, mechanization takes command because techne comes to dominate telos. For the Greeks, you could only evaluate a technique or skills or art if you knew its purpose, its telos. Now we've, for several centuries, embarked upon a form of schooling. It's not really education. That's George Grant, the Canadian philosopher, says. What we're in is schooling, not education. Because to be educated is to understand the relationship between techne and telos. We've increasingly banished telos to the margins if we haven't expressly denied its, its veracity. So the, the inflation of the subject of self and the deflation of the object has left us with a situation in which the will becomes paramount. My will over your will. My group over your group. Why my group? Well, because my identity is rooted in a small group, not in anything larger. And this is the tension. Uh, well, I, I, think, I think we need to be careful there, though, because like the my group over your group kind of thinking rather than my will over your will kind of thinking. I, uh, I mean, I, and feel free to disagree with me here, but um, um, I sense in a way that the, it is a sort of this, this, this identity politics related thrust in, in our contemporary politics. It is a sort of... Um, I don't want to say a repudiation, but it goes against uh, it. It goes against the project, the sort of liberal project of individualism, in a way. Uh, I feel that because because uh, um, okay. if we think about the, the the sort of if we go back to this idea that modern society, that the sort of industrial uh, society, uh, is uh, is uh, is constituted through the atomization of individuals out of these communities that used to be the individual and sort of their their so, sort of 
throwing them into this pool where they're all sort of always moving around this idea of we're, we're losing the telos well why are we losing the telos well because all every process has to be open-ended every process has to be uh, sort of we have to be able to analyze meaning take apart every process and then sort of put it back together in other ways again this is the basic idea of progress right this is sort of uh, gellner calls it a system where change is the only constant right change is elevated to the only constant right so so nothing is allowed to take on a, a sort of a sanctity no, no form of organization economic social caste stratum what what have you is 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 allowed to take on any kind of aura because everything has to be in a in a in a in a in a in a constant uh, in a constant um, uh, possibility embedded in the constant possibility of change. I think that's true. Right? But what's your hesitation there? Uh, well, well the, the idea. What I wanted to say was that that identity politics, so sort of my group over your group, it is a sort of a signal of uh, a dissatisfaction with this uh, with this kind of individualizing pro project at least in the sense that the promise of this project of yes we're going to take you out of your community but in return for that we are going to give you real mobility within this economic and social system a real chance of advancing yourself a real chance of sort of getting to do whatever you want and as an individual you will be sort of under the aegis of the state, you will be protected enough, right, through a legal framework, through an educational framework, through sort of the state, the infrastructure that the state, that the state puts at your disposal. You will be protected enough and you will be enabled enough to play within this field of constant change. That that promise is seen by people as not being realized. And an, a, an identity politics is a retreat as a result of this seemingly broken promise as a retreat out of this field of society back into some kind of field of community. Okay, I think there's truth in that. But let me explain what I think the problem with it is. First of all, there's an insight from Aristotle and from Aquinas that I think is relevant here, which is that we are drawn to the good. Okay, the problem in these identity movements, or let's look at the benefit first of all. Why am I drawn to celebrate my identity group? whether let's look at contemporary examples would be feminism, the women's movement, or um, think of another one. Um, well, it could be ethnic, it could be gender, it, anything, yeah. any group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why am I drawn? There's a good in that. What is it? It's the good of human sociality, right? It's the good of a framework that offers me hope or some kind of something against the anxiety of the Loss, of right? I mean, I, I, I mean, self. for example, the way it's put in the Combahee River Collective Statement, which is the first uh, first document in which the in which the phrase identity politics is used. This idea that basically, as an individual, as long as you're experiencing systemic injustice on an individual level, rather than connecting it to something greater than yourself, you just basically feel that you're going crazy because every everybody thinks that everything is going okay. Yeah, yeah. right. You are. You you are the only one who seems to be experiencing this on an individual level. You don't conceptualize it. You don't, you don't see it as systemic. But you come together with others who are in a similar situation to you, and it saves you, basically saves your sanity. You start to see, well, okay, the good, right? Uh, what you were saying, uh, putting it in some kind of social, in some kind of communal context. This is not just happening to me. This is happening to an entire group of people, right. and this is happening in systemic fashion. Okay, so what's the, what's the, that sounds good, right? But what's the problem with this? Well, the problem tends to be where the, um, where the deficit of culture or the deficit of human communities is located. And with identity politics, it tends to be, I think, with, as we say, with respect, they tend to locate the problem in the wrong place. Now, my, my lead here is an insight from Alexander Solzhenitsyn from his Gulag Archipelago, which, of course, is the exp lived experience of someone on the wrong side, we can call it, of Marxist-Leninism, right? Um, he ends the gulag system of uh, extermination and control leads him, he says, in the, volume, the famous passage, the bless you prison passage from the gulag archipelago. He says, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, bless you prison because on your rotting straw, I learned the truth, the central truth, that 
the, the line between good and evil passes not between re- nations, not between um, uh, religions, not between, and we could add to this the contemporary categories, not between sexes, not between genders, to use that term, but, he says, through the, the, hu- the center of the human heart and all human hearts. That's where good and evil is centrally located. That's the end of my paraphrase. But what this says is, no articulation of, quote, the global problem that focuses on sex, race, religion, um, climate, is going to get at the center of the problem if it doesn't have, in a sense, a universal insight about the human capacity for evil and the human capacity for good. Now, these partial identity movements, these identity movements are really goods, important phrase here, as far as they go. But where they become problematic is where they locate the enemy. The enemy, which according to Solzhenitsyn is located within, becomes the enemy without. So we have to get rid of the other, however we characterize it. So it could be the non-member of my religious group, it could be the non-member of my um, whatever my project is, my pet project. And what we start to do then is we, we start to then just transfer the war of me and you. We start to create a kind of disaggregate. We start to fragment this human project of difference, because we all have different voices. Mm. I mean, the interesting, there's an African concept of Ubuntu, which says, I am who I am because of my people. So the identity of the self is rooted in a social movement, a social understanding that would, in an African context, all in many ways be tribal. But therein is its problem, because we know what tribalism can lead to. Yeah. Right? yeah. Race is not a problem. Raceism is. Yeah. Sex is not a problem. Sex is actually the, the 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 distinction that you're making between the between the sort of um, the fight against the so, so, sort of the the, the 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 line as you were saying with Solzhenitsyn, the line that divides the good and evil inside of me and the line that that I externalize and that I put somewhere outside of myself and society. Interestingly, it sort of brings me to uh, to, to the concept of jihad in Islam because Mm -hmm. Islam, um, uh, in Islam, uh, jihad, uh, well, uh, like like, like all of these concepts, it has many meanings, but Mm -hmm. two main meanings are exactly this. There is the jihad, which is, uh, as we sort of understand generally, the term to be today yeah. you know the fight against the infidel the, the the kind of you know the religious war this kind of thing and then there is jihad understood as the the war against this the the kind of negative tendencies within oneself yeah. so there is the inner jihad and there is the outer jihad yeah. and the inner jihad draws that line as Solzhenitsyn uh, said I think that it draws that line between the uh, between uh, not between people, not between groups, not between uh, a, a, any kind of understanding like that, external understanding, but it draws the line within. And I think this is kind of also the secret of um, the coexistence. I mean, come to think of it, to, to bring it full circle. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, this brings us also a little bit to 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 the uh, why the coexistence of all of these religious, ethnic groups, etc., etc., was possible. Well, let's, let's, let's not say sort of, uh, I think we understand why it's uh, possible or even necessary on a political or an economic level. I think we understand that. But on a philosophical level, I think it brings us back to that because there was this recognition, as you were saying, uh, I think earlier, there, there's, there was this recognition, well, yeah, ultimately, all of these things are uh, paths, all of these uh, ways are paths that are leading towards uh, towards a similar or the same truth or some kind of, you know... But expressed some, through different lines. Exactly. Ex- ex- and there was this implicit understanding mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. And also sort of it made explicit, if you will, in the Islamic uh, sort of admonition to mm-hmm. for, for an Islamic state to protect other members of other religions. Well, it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, uh, expressed as people of the book, right? Members yes. of other Abrahamic religions should be protected under an Islamic state, right? They, uh, they shouldn't. So this is why, you know, a lot of uh, Islamic scholars, a lot of Muslims are also completely dead set against something like ISIS, because within ISIS, these things are not, you know, one of the things that ISIS 
uh, arrogates itself the 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 ar- arrogates to itself the 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 capacity the the authority mm-hmm. to decide who is the proper Muslim and who is not the yeah. proper Muslim. Yeah, for example. And this is a human problem. Right. Exactly. You see, you're going to find this with Cromwell's soldiers occupying Ely Cathedral and spending the day shooting the heads off angels in the chapel. You get this with iconoclasts in every tradition. You get this with the to use the term Pharisees in the way that it was used in the New Testament, where the Pharisees are, have a particular characteristic of external religious um, obedience, but internal. Uh, uh, right. They, they, they're just right. as, as Jesus at one point calls them right. um, whited sepulchers. Outside is all pure and clean; inside is dead men's bones. Um, so there's something f- interesting going on here in, in these different narratives. They share a common idea, which is the respect for the other. Who is the other and why respect? That, there's a tremendous commonality in that, not as we're taught in contemporary cultures. Massive cultural relativism uh, upon which we can make no normative um, statements. I, I fundamentally deny that, right. that there can be no shared normative evaluative frameworks despite plurality. I think that's absolutely wrong and it's completely wrong because it, what it says is that our primary condition is difference, not sameness. I don't think that's true. I think our primary condition is what um, Aristotle in the Western tradition at its best understood, which is that we have the capacity for great insights. And part of that is to understand that because I have a particular perspective, your perspective is necessarily wrong. And that's something that you, that you and I have discussed before in relation to the work on this Catholic theologian, John Courtney Murray, who was one of the key thinkers in relation to the most controversial Catholic document at the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, Dignitatis Humanae. What is that document about? Well, the relationship between church and state. And in a parallel document, Nostra Aetate, the Catholic Church had to formulate how it dealt with other religions. Well, these are really key questions for all traditions, including, by the way, liberalism. Well, the liberal would be the first to say, well, wait a minute, we don't have a dogma. We don't have a book of doctrine. We allow everything to flourish. Well, the question there is, is that true? Is, is contemporary liberalism really extending an open hand, to, for example, to the place of religions in, in contemporary cultures? Or is it rather not more acting like, um, like uh, with a kind of dogmatic um, exclusionism that one sees in some of the um, John Stuart Mill's writing, for example. Morris Cowling's book on Mill talks about his fundamental anti-religiosity. John Gray, in his book called Two Faces of Liberalism, refers to what he calls an illiberal tendency within liberalism from its earliest days towards, and this is interesting for our conversation, towards what he calls convergence, the idea that we must all necessarily agree. Well, he says that genuine liberalism requires that it turn its face against convergence in favor of what? In favor of modus vivendi i.e., how do we embrace a set of propositions that allow us to live together with difference? Now, is that insight not, in a sense, a very important substratum to our general conversation about the relationship between church and state, religion and diversity? I think it is. So I think, really, at the end of the day, whether we're dealing with liberal regimes, um, a separation of church and state, cooperation of church and state, or even if various forms of establishment, and you could de- detail this within the Ottoman Empire, uh, what is the place um, for divergence and respect for the other? And, and how does law and politics respect that or act against it? That seems to me to be a foundational question for our contemporary period of history. I think, uh, I think you've summed it up pretty well, Ian. And I mean, you know, the... I think the goal of our conversation in a way here is also not to sort of not just to kind of like, you know, lay out some facts or establish some facts, but to sort of inspire hopefully some interesting questions. And I think sort of arriving at this point where we've formulated this very, very foundational question is, I think, a good place for us to stop.
because I think our, our listeners, I mean, based on everything that we've talked about and based on this question that we're left with at the end, uh, this is a good starting place for a thought process uh, uh, among, among the people, among the people who are listening to this conversation. So I want to, I want to conclude on that note, on that, on that very poignant question, on that very important question, and take us uh, to the end of this uh, episode of The Last Ottoman, a podcast series in which we discuss, as you have seen, in sometimes a rather loose way, the Ottoman Empire and its legacy today. We are at the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking. My name is David Silim Sayers, and today I had the absolute pleasure of talking to Ian Benson, who generously took time out of his short visit in Paris to actually be together with me in the room. Normally, we record these podcasts uh, uh, via the internet, and this made a real, real difference to have you in the room, to be able to play off not just your voice and the things that you're saying, but your body language, your mimics, etc., etc. That made all the difference. I, I think this, is a, this has been a wonderful occasion, Ian. So thank you. Thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thank you, David, and thanks to... Uh, uh picked in Paris for the work it's doing, which I think is very important, and I'm delighted to be a small part of that. Well, if you, our listeners, would like to support The Last Ottoman or the rest of our nonprofit volunteer work at the Paris Institute, I cordially invite you to become a member of our community. Membership starts from three euros a month and enables free public lectures, open ac access online journals and podcasts, fair compensation for our course instructors, and everything else we do at the Paris Institute to create a public space for critical and creative thinking. And at this point, I might also add that starting from spring 2023, our membership contributions will enable us to make all of our humanities and arts course program, which is held in person in Paris, free for all our members. All of our members will be able to attend our humanities and arts courses for absolutely for free. Membership is easy. Just visit our website at parisinstitute.org. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next episode. Thank you.